Um, so why don't you start with what you took away from the information with Jeff Land, and then I will kind of say what I thought as well. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about is that, you know, the, the amazing thing that's happening now in medicine is that many, many people around the world in medicine are coming together to really give information in a way I've never experienced before. And the Institute of Functional Medicine has um, on their website has a, a list that I've talked about, a PDF of, of uh, supplements that are really to be taken if you do develop um, symptoms. And then what we also are seeing is other uh, things that you can actually download for, especially for physicians in terms of lifestyle, sleep, uh, some meditations and things like that. Well, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who's really the, in, in many ways for me, he's the father of uh, functional medicine. He did a webinar series with some of the experts and um, was uh, really floored at, um, Mark can't get in. Okay. I'm not sure why that is. Let's see what we can do here. Um, oh, shall I um, say my summary while you're working on that? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yes, of what um, Jeff Bland said. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, Jeff Bland is really one of my favorite people yeah. to listen to. He is the most extraordinary brain, and he makes my brain just light up and sparkle. So um, I always love it when Jeff puts his brain to a new problem because he thinks broadly, he thinks. Uh, universally, he thinks microscopically, and he's one of those people that can put all that together in just an amazing way. So this was one of his best talks. It really was. And he he took this to um, the, the part that I was fascinating. Well, there were many parts I was fascinated by, but the part I remember <laughs> being fascinated by right now was when he talked about how COVID, how the healthcare industry was going to be was before COVID and how it is going to be or could be after COVID. And he had um, some really, um, I think, brilliant ideas about that. Um, leaning towards uh, there's going to be more uh, cross state um, um, financing of healthcare. There's going to be more um, healthcare online and, uh, and, and not uh, person to person. Right now, the way we've got healthcare set up is the doctors get paid by person to person visits. And we need to change that to have more group visits, more um, uh, visits online. Um, it, it really will um, ex extraordinarily uh, increase the reach of each practitioner um, so that we have um, practitioners that uh, that uh, can be sitting at home and uh, and uh, and that's going to make things a lot easier um, there was something else about that that I uh, remember being really um, excited about but it, it was it was the um, it was just the the broad reach of, of how he came to the problem. And then, of course, he drills down into the latest science. So he talks about how the, um, the environment uh, uh, affects uh, whether you get COVID-19, how, how well you do with it, um, he, he was talking about, you know, there are sort of three things that we have to think about in order to decide, are we going to get this virus and how are we going to do with it? One is the virus itself. You know, is it mutating? Uh, how aggressive is it? Is it really, how many people are getting it? We don't even know really the answer to that question. Uh, so maybe this is a very mild virus unless certain circumstances come into play that put you in that category that needs to go into the hospital and get on a ventilator. Um, the um, uh, the other thing that he talked about that fascinated me was, uh, well, so that's the first part, the virus. The second part is the host. So how are, how are you as the host to the virus? Are you able to handle this virus? And I kind of like um, uh, having an attitude of this is 
a natural thing in our world that we have to accommodate. We have to learn how to live with this virus on the planet because it's here now and it's all around. And it's not something that we should, you know, shoot bullets at. It's something that we should ask, how do we get our body in shape to handle this virus so that it is not a big bad deal? And I think the, the, Second part of the talk that um, um, that Ari uh, I can't I, I can never remember his name. You know, hi, Mark. Nice to see you. Hi guys. I'm just talking until you get here. You're great. No, <laughs> we couldn't. We um, couldn't get you on board. Sorry about the that. Third, the third thing that is is you know you've got the virus, you've got the host, and you've got the environment. So then he talked about the environment, and we know that there are hints that the environment has a big effect on this virus. So. If you live in a polluted city, you have a harder time with this virus. If you smoke, you have a harder time with this virus. So we know that, uh, that chemicals in our environment, I think about the, the disaster that's happening down in Louisiana, in the southern part of Louisiana, they call that area Cancer Alley because there's so many uh, oil refineries and chemical refineries down there and the, and the entire place is so polluted that of course nobody lives there except the very poorest people who can't afford to live anywhere else. And that of course is who this virus goes after, um, maybe most aggressively. So um, I'll stop there and, and let you say what you- So I wanna introduce one of my dear friends, Mark, I can never pronounce your name properly, so I'm just gonna call you Dr. Mark. And Dr. Mark, I met probably, I don't know, how many years ago? 15 years ago? 15, yes. And um, is one of my greatest uh, teachers in terms of functional medicine. He's the, uh, the person that really is able always for me to kind of put the science and the heart together. And I'm just so excited that you're here today. And what we're trying to do today, Mark, is to really help people understand kind of the dynamics. Um, Bethany and I have a little bit different opinion in terms of the pieces to the puzzle of testing. And let's, you know, you and I talk a little bit about that as well. But the, the newest information that's coming out is we don't know numbers. And that's the problem with this, you know, as you just said, Bethany, is it could be really a big, big problem or it might not be as much of a problem other than the hospitals have gotten overloaded. And that was the issue that we're trying to keep the curve down. So how about Dr. Mark, you give us some of your opinions about kind of what your thoughts are and where you are because you're in a different part of the world than we are. Well, thank you, Marcel, and great to see you, Bethany. I love what you just said, Bethany. You, you, you always sum, summarize things so well and so personally. It's the host, it's the virus, it's the environment. And you've really got to take all three. And the talks that Jeff Bland and uh, Risa Vojani did together really put that in a way that uh, really lets us do the kind of medicine we love to do that we know works that should be the way we treat the host, protect from the virus and then protect from the environment. You know, the worst thing to be in this world right now is a man. Uh, uh, unless you're a developing country, then it's a woman. And you know, we've always known that, that the immune systems are different. So genetically, what is it? Well, is it behavior? Because men drink more and smoke more. Um, or is it genetics, that the epithelial cells of the, of the lung are just a little different in women there are in men? Is the immune response that we've always known autoimmune disease has different rates in men and women? So it's it's really a, it's, it's a fascinating question intellectually, but more practically, as you said, Bethany, this is an opportunity for people to look at all three of those. You can't change your genes, but you can change the way they express and the way that the virus interacts with them. And that's what functional medicine really is all about and why we're so passionate about it. So the part that I think I was so floored by when I was listening to Jeff was, and the other uh, people on there is, everything we've always talked about in functional medicine. I wanted to jump up and down and go, oh my God, we've been right all this time. Because it does have to do with toxicity. It does have to do with the food that you're eating. And the food is the most powerful information you're giving your genes. But it's also about stress. And that was the part that I was so uh, reminded of today is that the first response to our you know, virus is the mouth and our uh, mucous membranes. If we have too much stress, that first line of defense is gone. And for everybody now that's so terrified, I went for a run this morning and I was running and this woman was, there's a park that I go to because many of the parks are closed, 
behind my house. And I was, wa- I was running and she, she was like, oh, no, 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 there's too many cars there. And there were maybe 10 cars there. And when there are 10 cars, I see one person perhaps. And I was thinking to myself, that is the fear that is going to make us sicker. So how do we find a way to understand all this without being terrified of being around too many people and walking 15 feet away instead of the six feet away? I think we're going to begin to learn how to prepare our bodies to receive this virus. I think sooner or later, you know, Marcel and I have talked about sooner or later, maybe a lot of us, maybe most of us are going to get this virus. And over a period of years, maybe all of us are going to get this virus. So what I'm thinking about now is how, okay, so how do I prepare my body to receive this virus? How do we, how do I, improve my chances that I either won't get it or that I'll get a very mild form of it, that my body will go, oh, that virus again. Okay, well, that's no problem. Um, And I think um, one of the things that was great about this talk was that they went through the the steps that the virus goes through and where you can arrest it, where you can say, oh, sorry, you don't get to come into my cells, you know, um, and I think that's uh, um, exciting. It's not about just which supplements do I take? Which chemicals do I put in my body? What drugs will keep me from getting you know, a bad form of this? It's what immune system can you create in your body? How do you balance your immune system? It was that idea that, you know, okay, first you have too weak an immune system and then you have too much of an immune system. So how do we get a balanced immune system that can handle this virus, do what it's supposed to do and and keep us healthy? You know, Bethany, I think that's the challenge that we're we're really good at in functional medicine is inflammation. And it's not, too little or too much, it's attenuating the response to the inflammatory stress, whether it's fear, whether it's physical, emotional, environmental stress, or a viral stress. And I think it's the attenuation and the modulating of that response that's really so unique to the individual. And again, I just feel like this is an opportunity for us to engage with everyone around us, our clients, our family, our friends, to really look at this individuality. And, and as we know, people want that. You know, medicine's great for acute care illness. I mean, I think it's, so is it 20% of people or 80% of people that actually get sick when they get exposed? We don't know. And maybe the testing will help us. Of them, a third of them get really sick. Uh, 20% get hospitalized, 3% get to the ICU, 1% get intubated, and some percentage of that die. And, you know, we don't want to get to the ICU. We don't want to need a ventilator. We don't want to get to the hospital. How can we prepare the body, mind, body, and spirit not to ever get to the hospital, let alone have enough ventilators once we do get there? And so it's really a a paradigm shift of how do we prepare each individual uniquely to be as attenuated to that response as possible? Not too much, not too little. And then maybe this virus protects us from the next one. I mean, maybe this is the baby virus and the big bad virus is still coming. But if you've encountered this virus and taught your body how to deal with it, then the next one is like, oh, another one of those coronaviruses. Okay, I can do this. So I I think the parts that are going to be really important for those listening um, is the reality that what we know is that food is very, very important information that the, um, at one of the uh, talks by David Katz, I thought was fantastic. And what he said at the end of it was, you know, we're outraged about this pandemic. Why have we not been outraged at what the food industry have do- has done to us? They really created a, you know, a, um, a hand to mouth disease because you can't stop with just one. And most of those foods and many of those food have are really horrible for us, especially sugar. And the sugar industry spent thousands, millions of dollars to make sure that it's in everything. We can't be using those foods anymore. We need to have a way to also find ways to exercise, to decrease our stress in our lives, to have the microbiome of our gut. You know, we talk about it all the time in functional medicine, but that's so incredibly important in terms of the immune modulation, we call that. So it's the food, it's the thoughts that we think in the environment, the friends that we have, the community that we have, in addition to the stress that we have, 
We got to love the work that we're doing or find a balance for ourselves. And then of course the microbiome, all of those pieces go together to talk about what Jeff Bland talked about today, only he did it with the biochemistry. And that's functional medicine. It's really looking at what created the problem to begin with, what's the cause of the cause. And you know, all three of us have been doing that, but the world hasn't known how important it is until now. And now we're talking about the immune system and those of us in functional medicine have been talking about for so long. Yeah, the, um, the, one of the things that he said was going to be different after COVID in our healthcare system was that precision public health is going to be as important as individual interventions. We've had a interventionist kind of healthcare, a one-on-one, -on -one, that's what gets paid for, that's what we do, it's all about the drugs, um, and that's going to change with this experience that the whole world is having, suddenly we're like, whoa, wait a minute, public health, maybe we should have been spending money on that. And did he say, uh, Bethany, personalized community health right. versus public health? Yeah. And I, I love that, that mindset, and I do think it's gonna shift. I'm an MD, I believe in the acute care model, I used to run the ICU, I was in the SARS epidemic in Phoenix, and I, I know that acute care medicine works really well but it doesn't for chronic illness or for chronic preparedness. And to get the mind body prepared for this next potential pandemic coming in, and let's not fool ourselves, we're getting over one hump, but there's a second, third, and fourth one have to be coming behind it. Um, and then as you say, Bethany, it's, let's get ready for the next war. Uh, mm -hmm. That's gonna be the assault on our bodies. And, mm -hmm. and this is our opportunity for each one individually to look at all those, and it's a real opportunity and you know, Marcel, you talked about stress. My favorite analogy is it snows four feet in one day here. And the first woman comes in and says, it's so beautiful outside. I can't wait to go out and snowshoe or walk or ski. The very next woman comes in and says, oh my gosh, I hate it when it snows like this. I'm gonna fall and break my neck. So the same two external stressors can have these dramatically different internalizations. So this is our situation. This is our environment. What, is your, what are you gonna do with it? How can we help people make the most of it, and it become this positive outcome of a negative experience. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, so many people now have the pause and the time to be able to do this. I mean, and, you know, this is so, what a gift, you know? Yes, I know there's a lot of people that are really struggling with this whole, whole notion of money, and that will iron itself out. But worrying about it, unfortunately, doesn't make it go away nor does it make it better. So it's finding those opportunities. What are the little whispers in your life of things you can actually change? Uh, maybe it's seeing your kids for the first time because you've got time with them. Maybe it's noticing that spring for us in Maine is starting to come, the buds are starting to come out. Whatever it is, that's gonna be so important because the stressors we know also suppress the immune system. We've got a couple of questions here. Let me see if we can answer. Well, you're looking at that. I also wanna say, you know, uh, we're three people who, probably haven't experienced true hunger. Um, and some people out there are experiencing that hunger. So I want to put a, 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 a vote in for, if you have the wherewithal, we need to be feeding the people who don't. We need to be spreading that around. We need to not let anyone die of hunger during this epidemic. And you know, the music, the music concert last night shines so much of a light on what people are doing. And and how do you home shelter when you're homeless? <laughs> you know, I, I think that these are, what can we all do? Just a little bit that we can all give to someone else or to give to support our healthcare workers, our emergency, our first responders, each other. And you don't have to be an ICU medical doctor or nurse to be making a difference. It's the little things. And really staying at home. Okay. And this, this uh, concept and to see it worldwide is, is such a, an amazing, beautiful thing. Have you ladies noticed how your conversations are deeper with your friends and your family? Oh, absolutely. And that's yeah. the gift you're talking about, Marcel. It's been a real gift for me with my kids and the people around me. We're really having those great talks and I've, mm -hmm. I feel very fortunate for that. Mm -hmm. So somebody has a question for you, Mark. How do you pronounce your last name? And is it Italian? <laughs> it depends what continent you're on. In Italy, it's a Melicino. <laughs> So that's why I go by Dr. Mark, but Menolicino is we're from the heel of the boot in Italy, from Bari. Great name, though. 
Um, and somebody else asked about tapping. Yes, I am very familiar with tapping with Nick Ortner. And I think that's a fantastic thing to bring up because what I'm seeing, and I have moments myself, I'm, so I'm going, I'm a, I'm a dancer. And there's no way dance is coming back anytime soon for me. So I'm looking at maybe I'll learn how to play golf or something. I don't know. Um, but people are feeling pretty anxious. And tapping can be a fabulous way to take care of that. There's a woman whose name is Jessica Ortner. It's, it's uh, uh, Nick Ortner's sister who has a book on weight loss. And the tapping, they also have some online things that are free right now for anxiety. So that would be something to do. And it's just really learning how to tap and you're saying um, things while you're tapping. It's very, very simple. And it's, it is actually very effective for anxiety. So that's definitely something to consider. And somebody else had another question, and that was, how much did anyone look at the origin of uh, C-19, the Chinese epidemiologist working on coronaviruses before the C-19? Um, so somebody want to tackle that one? <laughs> is that person asking about the origin of the virus? Is this the, you know, where did it come from? Was it from the, the viral lab in Wuhan, or did uh, somebody uh, weaponize a virus or did the bats do it to us? <laughs> you know, like we're, um, there's, um, there is, uh, a, a, the intelligence people in the United States, probably at the president's behest are now spending a lot of our tax dollars to look into that and find out. So I'm sure we are going to eventually find out, uh, the, the genomics people say it is not a weaponized virus because that process leaves footprints and the the viruses that they've seen from early in this epidemic don't have those footprints so i don't think we need to be anxious that somebody created a weapon and that's what got us into trouble um, but i think it is possible that people playing around with viruses in laboratories can let things get loose just like we didn't, uh, we let pieces of that virus get loose in the CDC lab uh, that was creating our lab test. Um, these viruses uh, uh, like to jump and they like to go places and they like to morph. And if you get it and take it out of your lab, then who knows, you know, you may have an epidemic on your hands. So I think it doesn't really matter because we've got an epidemic on our hands. We've got a pandemic and it's a virus and we know some about that virus and we're learning more about it every day. And frankly, I don't really care where it came from. I care where it's going. How about you, Mark? I think that's the great perspective to have. Um, was it a mistake that it got out or was it something more devious? And that's what they're really trying to look at. I don't think it really matters. And the fact that they're actually experimenting with these at all bothers me to the core. That uh, makes it better. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting. Did it go from a bat to a pangolin? I've actually seen a pangolin. I saw one in you South really? Africa when I lectured them. They're such talking. interesting creatures. It's this kind um, of anteater looking thing. The whole concept with, with it is, is just bizarre. But uh, again, I think it's, so what do we do now? And how do we support each other and prepare ourselves? I think the thing that one of my friends said to me the most is, you know, we've got this theory about, well, we don't really, we're overreacting, we've ru ruined the economy, we won't know till the numbers are. The unfortunate part in all of this is we are where we are, and we don't know quite yet, and we won't know until we're on the other side. It is possible that there are many, many more people out there that have had it, um, and we know that we have by you know, slowing the curve, as we say, we've at least decreased the volume in some of these hospitals because they were totally overwhelmed. And I think we need to just let science and medicine and all of us that are on the front lines in some ways catch up. And that's going to be the part that's important. But what we can tell you now is that right now, the most important thing that all of you that are listening can do is to take care of yourselves, to start eating differently, whole foods. I'm getting a whole food delivery as we speak. Um, and get all the foods. What? How did you get that? I can't get that. In <laughs> you, just go on, you just go online and go to Whole Foods and you just put your order together. I'll show you how, Bethany. <laughs> but the important part is, and also that you have the PDF to have in that little cupboard for yourself to just make sure that you have the, the, um, the things that are really helpful if you do get the virus. That's going to be really important. So, 
and also exercising and spending time with yourself, writing, doing things that make you happy, getting all worried about this is not going to make us any healthier for sure. You know, it's interesting, ladies. Uh, do we really know what we think we know? And that's really the, the uh, all of us have been diving in. We're all scientists at our core. We love new information and data. And we're trying to stay ahead of this. And we're having a hard time. We're having to share with each other, have a call like this to share ideas because we can't figure it out. And it seems like the experts are having a hard time figuring this out. So it, it does surprise me that we're into mid-April and we know as little about this as we do. Like the testing, what should we do? And that's the real question I think that you wanted to get to ourselves. Like we, we don't know the source. We don't, should you open your mail? Is it okay to go to the grocery store? <laughs> you know, all these things, uh, you know, you can really work yourself up into a panic. All I can tell you is wash your hands. <laughs> it's the most important thing you can do and not touch your face. That's about all you can really do to protect yourself. And uh, the social distancing and how well it seems to have worked, uh, we won't know. As you mentioned, Marcel, we won't know for probably another year until we have the second bump. When well, we're beginning to get a, a sense of what things humans are doing that are working and what things humans are, are doing that are not working because there's so many different countries and so many different states that are doing different things. So I've been tracking these numbers since January and I can tell you that the graphs that they make are different in some places than they are in others. Like if you look at Iceland, uh, they have a plan that's test everybody and they've succeeded in flattening their curve. There's also um, New Zealand, which had a plan of shut everything down tight and they had a massive drop in the number of cases. So both of those have worked, but the trouble is, then what do you do? If nobody's, uh, if nobody's gotten it, then nobody is resistant to the virus the next time it comes around. And New Zealand is a, is a country that does uh, uh, tourism. I mean, what are they going to do when the first tourist arrives with this virus? They're going to have a problem. So, uh, so there is information out there. I mean, I've been scratching it together like a crazy woman. Um, but I think we're going to have ideas about what the best way to handle this is before too long. Beth, so you've done a great job. Go ahead. You've done a great job. I just want to personally thank you for your effort. You've done a great job for all of us by providing us those updates and it's it's a hard piece of data to crack so thank you so let's talk a little bit about testing i mean there are labs now that have come my way i've been listening to unfortunately webinars like crazy trying to figure out what's right what do i tell people what do we not tell people so i have the ability with a particular lab that i listened to a couple of times to actually send uh, tests for people that are blood draws they have 60,000 phlebotomists available around the country, so people can have their blood drawn, it's drop shipped to your house. But the bigger question is, what does that information give us? And let's all three of us kind of say what we think, and um, then we can let our listeners kind of make a decision. And that's the hard part, is that I don't think we have concrete answers. It may give us a glimpse, perhaps, of how many people, uh, how many more people perhaps have IgM, or IgG positive, which means they've had past exposure. But let me hear what you both of you have to say and uh, we can continue then the conversation. You're not gonna go first, Marcel? Oh, sure, I'll go first. So I, um, I, I have probably 20 people in my community that I absolutely certainly had COVID. One of them actually came back from China uh, two and a half weeks before he was put in the intensive care unit at the hospital. He got a pericarditis. They wouldn't test him. I'm as sure as I can be that he had COVID. Um, she got sick, but not as badly as he did. She was in my office as close to me as you could possibly be at that time until we started putting the puzzle together. Um, I am going to test them. I just want to see how many of those people, when I'm sure they've had it, have it. And I would like to avail this when I'm more comfortable to my patients that are interested to find out how, how nervous do I have to be. In the state of Maine, we don't have that many people that have gotten it, nor do we have that many people that have died. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to be stupid about the testing. So I think that we have to kind of dip our feet in the water just a little bit, you know, a little toe, and just do some um, evaluation. And then I'll probably go bigger in regards to that when, I, when I'm certain these people have had it. 
I do have an interesting story and that is one of my patients got it very badly. I sent her to the hospital because she was really sick and her husband just had a little bit of a sore throat, little headache. And I, he sent me a text message and what he said was all the things that were different between the two of them. They eat well, but she was skipping meals because she was stressed out. She's an HR manager. They were having to let people go and she was forgetting her supplements and she got some sick and she's still sick. It's been a month now. And there is some, everything we're saying tonight, folks, it's really important to know that the food, the nutrients, the, the, our immune system with regards to stress is part of that puzzle. So that's what I'm going to do. No, it's, inter it's interesting, Marcel. Uh, it's, uh, we don't know what we don't know. And uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, his brother Chris got COVID and was in the basement. And now he's given it to his wife, Christina. They've had two dramatically different symptomatologies. Right. And as you mentioned, we don't know how many people actually get it and never have symptoms. Mm -hmm. And what is it about the people that, that crash? And we, we talked about with the the work with Jeff and, and with Ari that we're talking about with the chronic illness and these, all these secondary cofactors. Um, I have a master's in immunology. I've been following this close. I can't tell you what the best thing to do. I can tell you if you have a fever and your body aches and you have a cough, you should get the nasal swab done. And how your friend was in intensive care with pericarditis and they didn't test him, that doesn't make any sense to me. I, and I think that, you know, this, this, uh, there is a, a limited resource with the swabs, with the reagents. That is a real deal. Um, but I don't know how real it is or why we're having such a problem um, generating that. So, you know, these are these kind of questions that don't really make sense to me sitting in Jackson Hole, having been in the lab and done these type of testing. Have you ever had an influenza nasal swab done? It is not a pleasant experience. No, it's not. It's the swab stuck all the way down your nose into the back of your throat, if it's done right. And a lot of times it's not done right. It's just stuck in the nose and not jabbed all the way down there. You almost have to throw up um, for it to have been done right. It's that aggressive to really be sure you get the nasal pharyngeal, which is way back in here. So I, 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 the IgG, IgM, IgA, here's the easy way to think about it. <clears throat> we use mono as our prototypical virus. When you kiss the wrong person, you develop the Epstein-Barr virus, which is mono. In about three to four days, this IgM antibody comes high and it lasts a couple of weeks and then it fades. After a certain number of days, the long-term IgG stays there and it's there forever. And as Marcel was talking about, this mucosal lining of our nasal throat, uh, mouth, all the way through the gut is IgA is our defense. So those are the three antibodies, IgM, IgG, IgA. And I think you have to test all three of them. And what I tell a lot of people about testing and whether you're checking for for a lot of different things in medicine is there's a positive predictive value and a negative predictive value. If you're testing for influenza in July when someone has a cough, your predictive value is not very high than when it is in January when the influenza is everywhere. So I like this idea of checking people for the flu and for COVID at the same time when they're symptomatic. The antibody, it would be awesome if we could test people to know like your friend that they've had it. I was in Eastern Europe caring for a family member. I came back sick, 104 degree temperature, laid up for three days. I got an influenza swab that was negative, but they wouldn't test me for COVID either. Um, I recently did my antibody test. It's on my website. We talk about the, I actually posted my results, IgG, IgA, IgM, and it's completely clear. But what I think is, and what I tell people, don't trust a negative. You probably should trust a positive. Now, the question is, with Epstein-Barr, we see people who get it again, even though they have IgG, so-called long-term protection. Some companies are saying it's 40 days that the IgG stays positive. Some people think it's 18 months. We think maybe it gives you immunity, but we probably are not certain about that because we're seeing people who have had it, have IgG positive, and then get sick again. So the, anti the antibody testing is not as clear-cut as we'd like it to be. It would be great if you could test them and you get a bracelet or a card that tells you you're safe and you can go work in the ICU as a critical care nurse. It's not going to happen. The tests are not that clear. So I think if you have an IgG, it tells you something, but it's, do you have it or not? And that's the IgA, IgM blood test and the nasopharyngeal swab. If those are positive, especially together, you absolutely have it. If your swab's positive and your antibodies are negative, I think you still have it. 
So you can't hang your hat on anyone for, for long term. And I think this idea of testing populations to know who's had it, who hasn't, it doesn't work on an individual scale, but it'll give us some group dynamics about what's going on in a community. So there's population testing versus individual testing. And that's where the, the antibodies, I think, are going to have trouble. Mm -hmm. That yeah. being said, I tested myself to see. And I was negative, and I was kind of hoping I was positive. Because then I, <laughs> I would think I had some immunity, but I might have been wrong. Well, and of course, we don't know if you didn't have it because some people who have it don't have antibodies because it depends on how strong the antibody stimulation is from the virus in your situation. If you have really great natural killer cells, you may not develop much in the way of antibodies. And so uh, the only way to know whether you had it or not would have been to test at that time. I think of the IgA test as sort of a test preparatory tests, like how good is your mucosal immunity? That's what's gonna protect you. So I wanna know that I have good levels of IgA. The IgM is the early antibody, so it can be used diagnostically. If you have an IgM but no IgG, then you may have an, uh, uh, you may be encountering the virus right then and there. And then the IgG is, did you have it sometime in the past? And of course the IgM and the IgG overlap so you can sort of watch it progress. I think individually testing, the article I read from Dr. Welch, who's the guy that looks at all the testing problems that we have with things like mammograms and PSAs and so forth, that we recommend that people all get tested for. Um, he, he made a, a he had a very good article that had a little interactive slider that you could change the specificity and sensitivity of the test and see how accurate the test would be in an individual person. It was quite horrifying, um, meaning the tests weren't that good. So for an individual who's asking the question, am I, uh, did I have the virus so that I know that I'm immune so that I can go to work? We can't give you that information. It's just not there yet. On the other hand, if they use the antibody test like they did in Santa Clara, California, where they tested 3,300 people and looked at how many people had antibodies, then you can get some information. Of course, that study was con confounded by things like who came to get the test. They sent out an invitation for the test in Facebook. And then, of course, who's going to go get the test? The people like you who thought maybe they had it back in January. So if they did, then they're going to see a much higher number of people with positive antibodies, which is going to confuse the question of the denominator. How many people, you know, if X number of people died, it's X out of how many died. So if we find out we had a lot of people who are in the denominator, well, that's good because it means the death rate is not as, as high. But it's bad and it's good. And it's also good because it means there should be a lot of people who are immune. But it's kind of bad because it means there are a lot of people out there with infection that are infecting other people and getting people who don't have the immune system that they want to have in trouble that lands them in the ICU. You know, Bethany, you mentioned the Santa Clara study. Aren't you a little surprised we haven't done large scale testing to answer this question? Well, see, I think we're doing the testing on the wrong people. I think we should be doing it on groups of people instead of on individuals. I don't need to know if somebody who's got a dry cough and a fever has COVID. I'm going to treat them the same until they end up in the hospital. And then at that point, if you need to know if it's COVID, because it might change how you treat them, well, I'm for that. But we're, we're wasting all our tests on people well, who I, want to know. Well, I, you know, so if you have a cough and a fever, you're quarantined for 14 days, whether you have it or not, whether it's uh, another, or whether it's the cold or the flu or COVID. And that's where I think we have to it's get to some resolution. Anyway, so what difference does it make right now when we don't have enough tests? <laughs> well, I, I, again, it'd be nice to have answered that question for individuals and populations. So we have some predictive value and some more knowledge base to go into this. It seems like we're still flying blind because we haven't done the, yeah. we haven't yeah. done a hundred thousand people in a controlled setting in a group with the antibody. I, I do think some version of antibody testing is going to be what we're going to do on everybody. Uh, and it's probably going to be a home finger stick that's been validated 
the blood yeah. con blood test companies are claiming 98 to 97 percent sensitivity and specificity which means if you do the test and you're positive you're 98 percent sure you have you either have it or have had it it's a pretty good number but it's not those are population numbers not individual the test they used in santa clara had a, a sensitivity of 80 percent which i thought was pretty dumb to use that the test, the test i did on myself was 98 percent 97.8 percent well, this test, they said it had a higher sensitivity than that, but when they tested it on known positives and known negatives out of Stanford, it wasn't as good as they said. So, I, you know, I think uh, we are going to have some problems with testing because we're rushing them to market and, we're, you know, FDA is giving everybody a, an emergency you, use certificate. You bring up a great point, is that are these tests comparing known positive COVID blood samples to an RNA generated in a lab. And that's the shortcut right. that these labs are doing. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of tests coming out of China that are not good. Um, so you're right, I, I think that's where, our, that's where our government can help us, right. is to do the validation with, with the, the power that they have to then have a standard that everybody's using. Mm -hmm. Well, this Santa Clara test was Ioannidis' work, and if you know his work, he's he's a pretty interesting researcher as well, and sort of. But a, only eighty percent sensitive is not good enough. Not yeah. good enough. Not even close. Moment. And I think the the kind of take home from all of this is that we will we'll you know we're going to be doing this next week. We'll probably have more information by then because we're all reading like crazy. Um, but I think it's important to know that the most important things for all of you that are listening to do is to change your diet to exercise, to decrease your stress, to have more connections with family, to more connections with nature. Those are things you can do something about. And, you know, the hand to mouth disease, we need to stop so that you're not eating the sugar and the things like that. And um, I think we will have tests. It's just going to take time. For those people that are interested in doing the testing, you can certainly, you know, we can try it out in my office and see. Um, but I think that, um, you will have to wait and see. We don't know a lot of these pieces that people are wanting information on. But you have um, the advantage, Marcel, of having patients that you're caring for, that you have high suspicion or low suspicion of positivity that you're going to be able to, you know, if, if somebody's just do, in a lab, just doing lab tests, right. they don't have the information that you have of uh, knowing your patients and knowing which ones are likely to actually have it, and which ones aren't. So you've got a piece of information that I don't think they calculate in. Yeah. You know, I, I so much respect both of you ladies so much with <clears throat> your, your skills and your cares and your compassion. Can I just ask both of you, for the men and the women that come to see you, what's the advice you're giving them that, to, to protect themselves? Do you, do you have kind of a, uh, if, we, if I could, Put you on the spot to get a sound bite. Bethany. Oh, absolutely. So I have everybody get the emergency kit, you know, and I believe it or not, this is what I'm having them do. I'm having them get, you're gonna laugh at this, a couple of bottles of Schweppes tonic water, quinine, and then zinc, you know, which is the emergency kit that um, uh, the Institute of Functional Medicine that I posted on here and I'll post again on the website. And then if they get sick, then we increase the vitamin C to 20 grams a day. We do the, you know, the zinc, we do the melatonin, we do the turmeric. So they have that just in, in case kind of thing. And in the meantime, it's making different choices about the food that they're eating and trying as much as they can with the quiet time to go inside and be quiet. The other thing I have people do is to look at what do I have in my life? What did I have in my life that I don't want any more of? And as I move forward in my life, what do I want to have more of? I mean, this, we've never had this in our lives before this opportunity, and we can take it to this place of, oh, well, I want to do more of this, or I want to do more of that. And for those of us that have the ability, it's also giving to people and maybe food banks more than we did before and to other places, shelters of foods that you have in your pantry that you don't need so that we really can support people because the lines of people that are hungry are much longer than they ever were before. So, um, and I talk about all those things with every single patient that I see because I'm still working with 10 to 15 people a day. Well, I'm not in practice anymore, Mark. Uh, so my practice is my family and friends. Of whom I have a lot, it turns out. Um, but I focused a lot of this on my 97, my 97 year old mother, um, who has um, uh, some respiratory issues. Um, 
And so um, my goal has been to find out, find enough information to keep my mother from, <laughs> from dying of this disease. She's going to die of something. She's okay with dying of something. She says, if this is what I'm going to die of, so be it. But I'm not okay with that. So, um, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what can I get her to do? And she is sort of resistant to taking pills. So she's, she does take some supplements, which I've convinced her to do over the last 20 years. And she does say, well, you know, I do notice that <clears throat> I am much more mobile and much more intelligent than many of my friends that I you know, go to sewing circle with. Um, so she's sort of convinced that something about those supplements may be a good idea. But the first thing she wants to do when she gets sick is stop taking pills. Um, so she does not plan to go to the hospital. And that's going to present some problems for me. So I've been working very hard to figure out how would I take care of my 97-year-old mother if she starts showing symptoms of this. Well, the first thing is, mother, you cannot get sick. <laughs> you just can't get sick yet. We don't know enough about the virus. We don't have the drugs. We don't have a vaccine. We don't know if the vaccine works, even if we have one. So I want you to not get sick until we have more information about that. Took about two months to get her to really clean up her uh, her person-to-person uh, -person interactions and, and not let people into her house. I said, this is your castle. Put the drawbridge up and don't Love let it. it down again until I tell you, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so we've, she's finally uh, cooperative about that. She is on some supplements. She is taking her vitamin D. She is taking some, um, I've got her on some zinc, um, which I will boost, like Marcel says, if she starts showing symptoms. Uh, I've got a few other things, and then uh, she has a CPAP machine, and so I bought an oxygen concentrator to attach to her CPAP machine. I don't know how to use it yet, but I got the manual here, so. <laughs> I can show you. I'm gonna learn how to use mine, and then I can tell So Mark, what do you do? What do you, what are you recommending to people? You know, I, I think it's the basics that we all believe in. So a good dose of vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, zinc. I do have an immune support supplement that kind of covers all the bases. Just, again, this idea of immune supplements, not to just boost it to over rev it, but to modulate it and attenuate it. Um, and then I go up when people get sick. So I, I don't think we really know, but it just makes sense. Let food be your medicine. Let kitchen be your pharmacy. Um, this is the time that we have and again, Governor Cuomo calls it the New York pause. Mm -hmm. We actually get a chance to just sit back and say, what do we want to do different? How do we want to do medicine different? How do we want our lives to be different so that we don't get in this position? Or as Bethany said, we're ready when it comes again. Right. I think that idea of all of us going inside and taking a pause is beautiful, Marcel. And, and you know, Bethany, you have such a passion and, and now I know why. <laughs> 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 and where your fire comes from. I love it. But we, I think we all treat every one of our clients as if they're our family. I just, if you treat people like they're, if you make decisions based on if they were a family member, you'll never make a bad decision for somebody. And I think that that's, that's a, a great way to do it. And, and then it's personalized. We're all kind of doing something a little bit different. Um, there is no one size fits all. Not at all. Kind of thinking of this as a prolonged silent retreat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my hair out some days though. So somebody asked the question, um, if they're in a very populated area, what do they do for exercise? And I think that's a really good question. Um, in some of the places, my daughter's in DC and they're uh, required to wear masks in any store that they go in. The question for some is, you know, if you take your mask off and you touch it and then you touch your face and you're kind of doing the opposite of what you really want. So you have to be very mindful if you are going to be using a mask to take it off properly and take it behind your ears and put it either in sunlight or, or th throw it away if it's, or wash it if it's um, something that you've made. So um, Mark, what are your suggestions for people that live in very populated areas for exercise? Because we want them outside to exercise. We want them in the fresh air. Yeah, you know, what about the guy that ran a marathon on his balcony? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm in Jackson Hole, and there were more people on the river hiking and in the bike trails yesterday than there has been any July tourism day. Yeah. So it's, it's trying to get outside, and I don't think there is good answers. Um, I think gyms are essential, and they should be able to do it, but um, I, you know, my thought is you get outdoors, you try to get in the sunlight if you have it, 
you know, cities, I'm not a city guy, so it, it would be hard for me to give good suggestions, but finding a way to do it. And, you know, I, I don't know how contagious this really is compared to if we were to pass Marcel jogging, if you could actually give it to me, mm -hmm. even if you sneezed at me, mm -hmm. um, would you? But I'm wearing a Buffy. I'm actually wearing two of them when I go out biking and I pull it up when I pass people. Um, so, and that's just so I don't give it to them. I don't think it protects me that much, mm -hmm. but I think we probably all should be wearing something or protecting our, uh, each other just as much as we're protecting ourselves. I'm from Texas, Marcel. If you sneeze on me, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not having you on their show again, Bethany. <laughs> we're over to dinner. I'm very serious about their guns. <laughs> so I think the, the reality is we don't know how contagious this is. It is possible we're going to find out that it isn't as much as we thought, but we don't have the information. So um, I think the most assuring we can be for you is that it's more than likely that the numbers are far greater than we see, in which case the death toll is much lower. And I think we're, we're trending to see that more, but we won't know till we know. And in the meantime, I think go outside and you know wear a, a mask. And if you bring it home, wash it. If you have one that you are gonna reuse, put it in sunlight because ultralight light tends to be very effective to kill the virus. Um, so I think that's gonna be the most important part for people. Let's make sure we- I think it is important to do a self-assessment of how mm -hmm. healthy you are. Yes. And then, from that, determine how much time you want to spend outside of your castle um, and under what circumstances. So if you're going to go to a place that's crowded, you better have a pretty happy immune system. If you're going to, if you're going to keep eating the wrong food and not exercising and you have some problems and you've got diabetes and you're obese, yeah, maybe you better stay in more, you know, until they get this thing figured out a little bit more. So I think you start with a self-assessment and then that self-assessment leads to what can I do about this? If I'm not where I want to be so that I can go back out in public, then how do I get there? I think the most fascinating thing for me um, looking at the research so far is that um, the number one thing that they're seeing, again, this may change, is obesity, is one of the, the markers that has been the trip up for people that were younger and having big problems in the hospital. So if that's the case, um, we'll kind of have to understand a little bit more, is that about, you know, the cytokines, is that inflammation, you know, what else is going on in the system, or is that just the diet was so poor, they had lots of sugar in it, and that's, we, we don't know. But that's a very simple thing to be able to do is, okay, there's so much stuff online now. How do I begin to make some dietary changes? And I use something called a medical symptom questionnaire that I'm sure you do too, Mark, and I know you did too, Bethany. You can go on my website, Women to Women Healthcare Center, and at the top, there's, uh, there's forms, and you can actually fill out that questionnaire. And if you find that questionnaire, with, when you add everything up, is greater than 30, you've got things that you need to do to change your life. That's a very simple thing that you can do to kind of look at where am I and evaluate where you are um, because that's going to determine if you have perhaps some gut issues, if you have, you know, fatigue issues, emotional pieces that are too high, all of which can upset the immune system. So that might be a place to start as well. You can also use that questionnaire to see how you're doing with your program. If your numbers are not dropping, then you need a consultation with Marcel to find out what you're doing wrong because those numbers go down for people when they start doing the food right and the exercise right and the sleep right and the um and the stress reduction right they just do you know those are great ideas uh ladies just it's just self-empowerment right it's do something to assess yourself mm -hmm. then take the pause and decide what you're going to do about it mm -hmm. and pick one area and even if you pick one thing to change tomorrow that's all you have to do you know we all think we have to eat the whole elephant so start with biting the tail Just take one little piece Just do one little thing and it would be my advice would be go take a walk better to do it with someone you care about more important to do it with someone who cares about you even if it's your dog uh it's uh, get out and get some movement and and as marcel always says take a moment for yourself and go inside and and do that self-check as bethany was suggesting i love that do a self-assessment where am i where are you where do you want to be?
And what did you have too much of that you don't want anymore before? And what do you want to change for going forward? I think all those are really important. Somebody yeah. asked a question um, about the uh, Schweppes uh, tonic water. It's quinine. The question is, you know, whether some of the medications that have, you know, it's uh, Plaquenil that's used for malaria, um, if that really is helpful. It has been shown to be helpful for some people, and it might just be something that would be helpful to have if indeed you have the virus. So that's just to have in your emergency kit. And somebody asked a question about the website. Uh, the website is Women to Women Healthcare Center, and you can look at the top, and there's forms there, so you can look at the MSQ, make lots of copies for yourself so that you have those so you can continue to. Um, then do it over and over again. Somebody else asked the question, is it true that uh, people pa uh, are dying from COVID or passing for blood clots in the lungs? That's the answer that, that one, really right? that's come up is that uh, the, the CAT scans, and this is, uh, there's some work, some, some, some work out of China that's been evaluated by some physicians in, in England that are friends of mine that are talking about these peripheral blood clots that we're seeing on the CAT scans. The, the COVID has a very unique CAT scan appearance. And in China, they were actually using that instead of the testing as a diagnostic tool for a period of time. Uh, again, I think it's, it's like the iron issue. Is this a really a, a iron viral issue? There are all these things that we're looking at. And um, you know, it's, it seems like it's been around forever, but what were you doing in February? <laughs> I was skiing. <laughs> I was on the tram with 110 people and there were people coughing. Uh, and like I said, I came back from Eastern Europe after working and, and was super sick. And um, so it's, I, I just think we don't know. But there, there has been a theory that these are peripheral blood clots. And um, once you get someone in the ICU, all kinds of bad things happen to the body, particularly with the clotting system. And so blood clots are, are the, the, um, the, the thing that we worry about the most in inpatient medicine is someone getting a blood clot. You have a risk just from being in the hospital of getting one, let alone being so sick and being immobile. Yeah. So I there's something the, there, but I don't know. I think the I blood clotting that they're talking about with COVID-19 is a uh, more like a disseminated intravascular coagulation problem, as opposed to a pulmonary embolus where a blood clot blocks off the blood to your lungs, and then you can't get any oxygen. Uh, into your blood because there's no blood going through your lungs. These are little micro clots throughout the system which affect your kidneys and your liver and your lungs and your heart. And, uh, and we do see disseminated intravascular coagulation with viruses and with very sick people and with people in ICUs um, and with pregnant people. And so uh, it, it's uh, not uh, unexpected that we might not see that. I don't think it's really common. And if you're that sick, you're going to have uh, somebody who really knows intensive care and knows ventilators and knows uh, to look for that uh, sort of situation. So I wouldn't, I, that's not something I'd spend a lot of time worrying about. I think you're absolutely right, Bethany. And, you know, having taken care of intensive care patients, uh, once someone gets this respiratory failure that they call ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, they, that's one of the hardest things to reverse and all kinds of bad things happen and out of the blue, like the disseminated intravascular coagulation, kidney failure, heart failure, the whole system just starts crashing when the immune system gets that angry. Um, and, you know, let's be, let's be very frank about it is 85 to 95, 85 to 90 percent of people, nine out of 10 people who go on a ventilator for any reason don't come off. So the key to this is not having more ventilators. Because 85 to 90 percent of those people, for any reason, on a ventilator don't come off. Um, so it's about not getting on a ventilator, not getting to the ICU, not getting to the hospital. How can you help your body get stronger, your immune system stronger, so that when the virus does get you, and it's very possible it will, you don't become one of these statistics? And I think that that's that's the motivation that I have for my clients and and for family is. Um, I think I do think that. We all hear these stories of the, the super triathlete that ended up in the ICU and died. Those things happen and we don't have great answers for it, but the majority of people who get sick don't end up on a ventilator. And the ones that do have underlying illness, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, respiratory disease. And you've got to remember a triathlon is a huge stress to your body. Training for a triathlon is, I love, you know, I loved having women who came in and said, well, I'm, start, I'm, go, I'm going through menopause, so I've decided, I'm really stressed out and I can't sleep, so I've decided to run a triathlon. 
excuse me, how about, how about we back up here a minute and talk about how to get your adrenals in good shape before Let's you- Let's do baby steps, yeah. Like baby steps, let's move back here a little bit. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think that necessarily being able to run a marathon is a sign of, uh, okay, it's a sign of a lot of capacity, but not always great health. So somebody asked the, call, uh, the question about, well, should we take aspirin? I'm not quite sure why they're referencing that. If Oh, because they're worried about getting blood clots perhaps. Um, no. I don't know that I would take a baby aspirin every day just for that reason. I think the thing that we really need to reiterate here is that most people that get this don't get really sick. It's probably more like 90% of people. Right now, it looks like 85%, but I have a hunch it's going to be more like 90% of us don't get sick. And of the 10% that do, seven of those 7%, they get mild symptoms and then the others get pretty sick. So the statistics are probably not gonna show us that that many people are that sick. I could be wrong, but that's my hunch so far. Do you think, Bethany, do you agree with that? No, don't do aspirin, do omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah. If you wanna do something that's healthy, that will help you with blood clotting, that will improve your situation with COVID-19. Omega-3 fatty acids look pretty good in a lot of different ways, and that's the direction I would go. Well, that's the old Mark Twain quote. It's not what you don't know, it's what you think you know that just ain't so. <laughs> what do we find out about aspirin? We're told everybody should take a baby aspirin a day. Actually, that's not true. More people die from bleeding ulcers from aspirin than are prevented from heart attack and stroke. So this aspirin a day idea has never been a good idea. Well, and there's really not very good, there's really not very good data on women taking aspirins anyway, so. Yeah. Well, they're gonna shut us off pretty soon because we've been over our hour. So any final remarks that you wanna make, Mark? What would you say, Dr. Mark? I would, I personally, again, would like to thank Bethany for the hard work you're doing in the, and just the way you're, you're culminating this information for a lot of us in functional medicine is super appreciated. <laughs> and I, I really think for everyone listening is, is do something tomorrow for yourself and then do something for someone else. Um, this is a real time to take a pause and reflect on what you can do for yourself, but also what you can do for other people. And I would say exactly the same thing. You know, now's the opportunity for that little small change in your diet. Or if you are needing to lose weight, that you really make a step for yourself to kind of figure out what's going to be something that I could do differently. And we will be here next week um, having a continued conversation and maybe we'll know more because we're learning new things every week about the testing. So everyone have a wonderful, wonderful week. And thank you so much, Dr. Mark and Bethany for being with me. Appreciate it. Great to see you.